What is and who is cast into quote unquote outer darkness? You want me to go first on that? Yep. Okay. Your turn. Unless okay. You want. No, it's fine. Um, well, again, uh, there's a well, there's a there's a ministry uh, called Grace Evangelical Society. Uh, the notable founders were Zane Hodges and Bob Wilkin, but they have a, a general uh, stance or position that outer darkness is for unfaithful believers. Uh, that they will it, it basically they're saying those verse passages that refer to outer outer darkness are in reference to um, people uh, believers who don't get the full joy. They they have a limited they have a limited privilege and um, limited uh, closeness to Christ, I guess, um, in in eternity. Or it's it's a metaphorical way of saying they they have less privilege in eternity. Um, and so I, I I strongly disagree with that, and I, I think it's easily refutable. But um, I mean, I, I just right, right from the beginning of you started with Genesis, and it's clear that darkness is for or for unbelievers and. Um, uh, light is for believers. Uh, so we read in Genesis w- verses 1, 3 through 5, Then God said, Let there be light, and l- and there was light. And God said, Let the light, and God saw the light, that it was good, and divided the light from the darkness. God called it like day, and the darkness he called night. So evening and the morning were the first day. John 1, uh, verses 4 through 5 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, or understand it, or overcome it, that word comprehend. So again, uh, we see that light in the Bible, especially in in, in the Gospels, is um, in reference to spiritual light. Uh, Other verses uh, in John 12, 36 says, While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verses 4-10 through 10 says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or, nor of the darkness. Uh, so again, Scripture makes it very clear that believers in the Lord are of the light. Unbelievers are in darkness. Um... And a lot of the verses where you see uh, the the cast them into outer darkness, they're also you also see another theme that says weeping and gnashing of teeth. And if you compare these verses together, you'll see that they're all referring to unbelievers. It, it's very clear. It's, yeah, I don't. It's not difficult. <laughs> um, so the, one of the first ones is in Matthew eight uh, eight Matthew eight uh, verses eight through thirteen. It says that the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers on me, under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when, Je- when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east to the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And this servant was healed that same hour. So again, you see the contrast of the Jews who are the sons of the kingdom in that sense, because they were offered the kingdom initially. The king, When Jesus first came, he came to offer the kingdom to the Jews. That's why he said the kingdom was at hand. But because they rejected the king, they, the kingdom was postponed. And I believe it's coming in the millennium. Uh, but uh, this Gentile, he had faith. And so, again, the Jews in Matthew are generally depicted as unbelievers and hypocrites. And the reason they're called hypocrites is because they're workers of iniquity. Anytime you're under the law, uh, you can only become a hypocrite because you can't keep the law. Anyone who pretends that they are keeping the law is automatically a hypocrite. For first of all, you must keep the whole law. Uh, if you stumble at one point, you've broken all of it. So you're automatically a hypocrite. Uh, even if you're under the law of, of conscience, 
uh, Romans makes clear that uh, they, the, even the Gentiles who did not have the law, uh, they not only uh, excuse, you know, th their own own conscience is accusing them, but they excuse their sin with among each other. So they're hypocrites, and that's why. So in, in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew and also the synoptic gospels, uh, hypocrites and unbelievers are really kind of synonymous. Uh, cause you're, because you're an unbeliever, you're under the law, and if you're under the law, you're a hypocrite. And so, uh, it gets an important distinction. Um, and let's see here. Um, uh, I mean, there's so much I could say, but, uh, it, 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 so, here, so here's another example. Um, it says, uh, in Matthew 22, verses 1 through 13, or sorry, 8 through 13, it says, then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Again, good and bad. It had no it has nothing to do with the righteousness at all. They, uh, all, all were invited. But, the, the, but when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And by the way, some people say, Oh, well, he called him a friend. Well, he also called Judas a friend. Uh, so it doesn't mean, you, it, it, just because you're a friend, Jesus calls you a friend, doesn't mean you're saved. Uh, and it, so he says, And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot. Take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And again, why is he bound hand and foot? Well, first of all, the law binds you by hand and foot. The law binds you. And I believe the reason why Jesus said bind him hand and foot so none of his filthy works, he couldn't do any of his filthy, iniquitous deeds in the banquet, in the in the kingdom of heaven. And again, he's cast into outer darkness. I think, again, it's, 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 a, it's a poetic or uh, artistic way or uh, a very, uh, a very um, visual way of depicting a hell, essentially. It, it, it's darkness. It's it's outside of the kingdom of heaven, which is light. They're, they, they're going to go into outer darkness because that's what they are. They're children of darkness. Uh, in, uh, so uh, another uh, example, it's in Matthew 24, 46 to 41. Uh, he says, Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I will say to you that he will make him ruler of all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards, that master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and an hour that he is not aware of, and he will cut him in two and appoint him with a po appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. And that same parable is essentially in Luke, but instead of saying appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, he says, with the unbelievers. So again, you see unbelievers and hypocrites synonymous. And again, cut him in two. Cut him in two. That's covenantal language. That's what they did under the Old Testament. They would slaughter an animal and cut it in two to indicate that if either party broke the terms of the covenant, that, that that's what would happen to them. They, they That's what they're deserving of. They deserve to be cut in two. And again, this proves, again, this th th being cut in two, uh, first of all, well, God joins us under, let no man cut in two. Christ is not a wife beater. He doesn't beat his bride. These are unbelievers. They they were uh, they're under the Mosaic Covenant, and because they were unfaithful to it, he cuts them in two. Uh, he points them at the portion of the hypocrites. Weeping and gnashing of teeth is a picture of uh, eternal regret, and uh, gnashing of teeth, I think, is a is really just utter hatred for God. They're going to hate God. Just like when uh, Stephen, uh, they went to go stone Stephen, they said that uh, after Stephen gave his uh, his rebuke of Israel, they gnashed their teeth. They hated him. They wanted to kill him. They they were bloodthirsty. They were murderous. And, and that's what they will be, uh, that's what they will be forever uh, seen as. Um, again, I could go on and on. Oh, uh, yeah, I could go on so much, but there's so well, much. I come back and do, take a follow up. And say, well, okay, okay, so okay. Yep. Okay, go ahead, Renee. What do you have to say? Yeah, uh, that that happened to be there's. It's in several places, the outer darkness, but uh, that's exactly what I pulled up, uh, Matthew. Uh, no, I I really strongly strongly disagree with GES. 
it is so clear that he's speaking to Jews that reject him because all the covenant language is there. Children of the kingdom. Now, the reason he calls them children of the kingdom is they were the covenant people. He was to come to them first. And so if you look at the language here, uh, it's clear they reject him. You see over and over again, for instance, when Jesus says, uh, uh, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, thou bearest record of thyself and thy record is not true. So they call him a liar. And Jesus says, though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but you cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. You judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am the I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one that bears witness of myself, and the Father that sent me also bears witness of me. Then they said unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, You neither know me nor my father. If you had known me, you'd have known my father also. So it's clear here. They reject him. They are not of God, but they are called children of the kingdom because they're the covenant people. And the message was brought to them first. So don't be tripped up on that language. The, the, the weeping and gnashing of teeth is clearly, like he said, angry resentment because they gnash their teeth at Stephen. They're going to resent that Gentiles are coming to the kingdom and sit down and eat with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their patriarchs of the flesh, before them. And that's what Jesus is saying, and that infuriates these people. That's why John the Baptist said, think not to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father, because that's genealogy isn't going to save you. So here, uh, the one place he mentioned, all these stories are telling the same thing. You are supposed to know who I am. You have the light of the scriptures. You have the light of the law. You have the light of the prophets. And you still don't recognize me. Um, and so when the centurion, which is the uh, uh, short scripture uh, Ben gave you, said, you know, hey, I'm a man under authority. All you got to do is say the word and he'll be healed. Then Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith. No, not in Israel. Then he says, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom, people of Israel, shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's why he calls them children of the kingdom. You see, he's telling them here, this centurion, this Gentile Roman, because of faith in me, is going to sit down with the patriarchs in the kingdom and you yourselves thrust out. That's what he's telling them. And it's, it's very controversial and it makes them very angry. I don't think people understand what a big deal this was. These were the Pharisees and the scribes. They were the lawyers and doctors of the law. They were held in highest regard. People moved out of the way so they could walk in the streets and have the best seating at all events. They were very well respected. So for Jesus to just tell them flat out, you're a bunch of unsaved hypocrites. Your heart's wicked. You're full of dead man's bone. You brood of vipers. It, it's a big deal. And so there's nowhere in scripture where a believer is in darkness. We're, we're not in darkness. We're in the light because he is the light. You just heard that. But they're in the darkness because they reject him and they reject the witness of who he is. So it's very clearly unbelievers and more specifically unbelieving Jews in these verses that he's talking about being in outer darkness. Okay, yes, amen to that. Um, 
All right. Well, the first thing, remember, uh, <laughs> have you ever heard me say that uh, our doctrine should not be based upon uh, con a confusing, ambiguous verses that everybody's arguing about what it means? Rather, our, our doctrine should be based on the verses that are clear and explicit. Uh, this is not an idea I came up with. This is just one of the fundamentals of Bible interpretation and understanding. Uh, so if the Bible tells us that uh, if you believe in Jesus, you're not condemned, okay, we have to begin with that. Uh, so none of these references to outer darkness, it's, is it ever possible that we could say that it's referring to a believer because we know that believers are not condemned. So let's just settle that right off the bat. So who who are these referring to? There's three references, um, Matthew 8, 12, Matthew 12, uh, 22, 12, Matthew 25, 30, all in Matthew. I would also caution everybody, uh, I would say Matthew, Acts, Hebrews, James, and Revelation. These five books here is where the problem is for most people as far as this is, this is where the people are getting confused and getting misled. They're the hardest books to, to understand regarding salvation because the Lord shippers go there to support their doctrine. Uh, so what we should be going to is the book of John and, and, and uh, Galatians and uh, Hebrews, if you understand it correctly, is one of the best uh, faith alone and eternal security, but most people don't understand it, right? Uh, you certainly don't want to learn about salvation from the book of Revelation. That's not what it's for. Uh, but uh, so be, you got to be careful. When we're talking about Matthew, and let me see the first reference, 8.12 says, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, in, in, the, in this case, this is, is talking about the non-believing Jews. Okay, so that's the context. That's been covered very well. Uh, the, the next one is uh, Matthew, let me see, uh, 22, 12, 22. Two. And that says, uh, and he saith unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Oh, come on. We know the wedding garment represents salvation, the righteousness of Christ that's imputed to the believer. They don't have a wedding garment. So again, it's it's referring to a non-believer. And then the, the last uh The last reference is 25, 25, 30. And that says, and cast ye the unprofitable servants into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now this is the more difficult of the three uh, references to outer darkness. If you study the context though, this is a person that says they don't they don't think much of the master. <laughs> they think that they're a really hard, uh, you know, it's very insulting what they actually say about the master. And so that gives me the conclusion that they don't love, they don't believe in the master. They, uh, so uh, we have all these cases, I think the conclusion is should be easy that these are non-believers. In fact, from the first, all the verses that we could cite that say believers are not condemned, then it's impossible to uh, for that to be your conclusion. Uh, all right, does anybody want to say anything more about this one? Well, I, just that uh, real quick, that last uh, parable you said uh, with Matthew 25 is the most difficult one. Um, that person who he refers to, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, that he's called the wicked and lazy, lazy servant. A lot of these parables, I, to me, by my whenever it's reading, this is I think this is key. I, uh, I think this is amazing. I think you'll really enjoy this. But you got to see most of the 
the the the scary passages, so to speak, or misunderstood passages in Luke and Matthew and Mark. Uh, he's ta he's talking them to them as like a, he's talking to the the Jews as like their slave master because they are they're, they're they have never been free from the law and. You see the same language that uh, Pharaoh used of the Jews when they were in Egypt. So if you read Exodus five, and if you if you in Exodus five you read about the the Pharaoh and the task his taskmasters, the officers and taskmasters. If you substitute the officers and taskmasters with the with scribes and Pharisees, uh, and Pharaoh uh, essentially as as God as Christ. Again, he's executing judgment under the law, and that's why it's so cruel sounding. Like he says, "You wicked and lazy servant." Well, that's what the that's what Pharaoh was saying to the to the Israelites. Idle, idle. You you know you want to you you're not working hard enough. You're you because you, you're again they're being judged by their works because they're not because they're under the law. And he calls them wicked, lazy servant. And um, in that parable too, in, in Matthew, if you look at the there's a, a almost an identical one in in Luke. And that wicked and lazy servant, he also says, For I feared you, because you are an austere man. You collect what you do not did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And then uh, then the master said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. And then so what's funny is that that wicked servant didn't understand his master. And that's what the whole idea of, of Matthew is, is that the G Jesus came and they didn't understand the time. They didn't understand his word because they didn't understand the scriptures. They they had no understanding. That's what the uh, parable of the sower is about. Um, and what's interesting is that he said, you reap what you did not sow. Well, in John, he Jesus says to his disciples, I sent you to reap for which you have not labored. So again, he's... It, they have a completely different relationship. One's under grace, one's under the law. One has understanding, one has no understanding. And it's those who have no understanding, have no belief. Those are the ones that are going to be cast into outer darkness. Yeah, I, I want to add something there. Let, let me say something to the saints here, regardless of how much Bible you know. These verses that condemn and threaten they are never to a believer in Christ. They are never to someone that's trusting in Jesus and in his grace. Amen. It is never to you. Never. It is always to break the self-righteousness. And if you, if you can see that in the in synoptic gospels and can see that they're still under the old covenant law and that the standards need to be like brother Luke says, ratchet down, tightened up so these people realize they need him. Then you can see better. But unfortunately, today, the people are still law minded. They're still legalists. And they read through these things as if it's to the body of Christ. It's, it's all for us, but it's never directed like none of these threats of weeping and gnashing of teeth and outer darkness and you wicked servant and throw you out and cut you asunder and break you and kill you body and soul and all of it. It's not to a believer trusting in God's grace and the shed blood of Jesus. It's never that. So um, unfortunately, if you go in there with a law mentality, that's all you're going to see. And it's going to break you and make you guilty. And it's going to, one of two things is going to happen. You're going to be hardened and blinded to your own sinful state and think you're actually living up to some standard now. So you can judge everybody else and condemn us because, you know, we just love sin. That's why we promote grace. Or it's going to make you so guilty that you're broken. And you realize your need for a savior and you go, I give up. I, I, I got to trust in your shed blood, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to make you realize that. Sadly, some people go in the other direction and that's all they see. That's why they take things like Matthew 7, 21, written about false prophets, religious people trusting in their own works. And he was clearly gearing this toward the nation of Israel. Lord, Lord. 
Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? Have we done many wonderful works? If you go to Isaiah, the workers of iniquity are always those that are unbelievers. They're enemies to God. They're not, it even says enemies of God. It's, it's not believers. And it's just sad that people take these verses and use them to hurt babies when we're supposed to be growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot go outward and share the love and grace that God has given you if you're not even aware of it, if you haven't received it yourself. It's something that you have to receive yourself in order to give away.